We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level. You can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Great, long time no speak, as I said to you before the show. I think, I think, uh, it's, I think it's been since 2017 or something, and that sounds like such a wonderful, blissful, easy year compared to what's going on now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The lovely days, the golden, golden past, right? <laughs> I know. It was just a simple, simple, simple expedition up to Sydney and a, a lovely sit down, a nice cup of coffee with yourself. And then we flow back down to Melbourne. It was, it was lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look where we are now. <laughs> I know. Well, you, you've actually gone back in the past. You're in the 1950s. <laughs> yes. Yes. 1950s sci-fi. You've got to love 1950s sci-fi. So yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and I've been catching up on a lot of it, right? So, you know, in lockdown, uh, there's so much to catch up on. Oh, it's just insane. I know. I've, I've found there are always ups and downs with everything. Hey, like I think, um, you know, especially down here, we've had to sacrifice a lot of uh, freedoms that we were, you know, we were taking for granted, I suppose. But um, on the plus side, I've, I've, I've been able to do a lot of writing and a lot of reading and uh, I've read more books than I ever had in my whole life. So there's always, you know, I don't know if I'd probably want to sacrifice the, the freedom stuff for, for the rest of my life for the sake of reading, but you've got to look on the positive. Yes, yes, yes. There's opportunity to learn, right? That's the yes. important thing. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and and since, since you and I caught up last, so for everyone um, just listening in now, great. this I think is our third chat now because uh, we did two uh, with, with Bill and I. We're actually going to start a mm-hmm. new show, Bill and I, in the, in the next oh, couple of excellent. months. Oh, so. excellent. We'll have to get you on that show as well, mate. You're you're a long time. Sounds friend. good. But uh, yeah, the last time we spoke was was a while back. But you've you've um, written some books in in the meantime as well. Had you? I don't think you'd written a book before. When, when did you write your first book? Oh, so actually, the first book came out in uh, at the end of 2016. So it was only oh, really yes. kicking off about then. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we've had another book published, uh, earlier this year mm. and I've got another book coming out next year. Oh, brilliant. So yeah, so it's been, it's been a little bit busy. I was supposed to go on a, a little bit of a book tour to the UK, um, after the book came out, but it was published in February and of course haven't been anywhere. Yes. <laughs> God, it's just been insane like that. I know. Yeah. It is like I'm on Mars and you're on earth <laughs> and we're doing some dodgy relay. Exactly. Is that four minute time difference? <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, yeah. So you got these books coming out. So I don't think I, um, I don't remember us actually talking about the first book. So give us a bit of an idea of what the first book was about. Okay. So the first book is called uh, a fortunate universe life in a finely tuned cosmos. And it, it's about this um, issue in physics, which is really bothersome. So we, you know, live in the universe, we're governed by the laws of physics, and we've got all these mathematical equations, but to use them, there are numbers that we need to know. So if I want to calculate something to do with gravity, I've got to know Newton's gravitational constant. If I want to do something in quantum mechanics, I need to use Planck's constant. And those numbers, you can only find by measuring them. So you can't find them by doing any clever mathematics, you've got to actually measure them. So the, a lot of people have wondered, right, why does our universe have this particular combination of fundamental constants that control the masses and the forces? And if you play around, you, you know, you can, you can come up with um, fake universes, right? You can, I could still have exactly the same questions, but I could change those numbers. I could change Planck's constant or I could change the gravitational constant. Ask, what's the consequences of that? And the answer is, is that if you do small changes the results are catastrophic, Mm -hmm. right? In the sense that the universe you end up with is very different to the universe we inhabit. And just to give you a simple example, um, you know, if you mess around with gravity, right? You think, oh, gravity, okay, it's just a force. But gravity controls an awful lot of things, right? It controls the rate that the universe expands. Mm. So, you know, if you wind that number up too big, then the universe is born and collapses in a second. Yes. Chances for life in that universe, not much. 
or you make it too weak. The universe is born and it, it expands so quickly that um, you're left with one atom per observable universe. Chances of life in that universe are also, you know, kind of hard. Mm. And if you play with all these numbers, you, you'd find out that it's actually very easy to have a universe which is dead and sterile. And so we're left with this question of why are we in a universe that isn't dead and sterile? Mm. What you find is very, very easy to make a universe which is dead and sterile if you've got a different mix of physics. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, how can we live in a universe where it seems like the physics is just right? And one of, those answers, one of the answers to that is, is kind of obvious, right? We, we wouldn't expect ourselves to be in a dead and sterile universe because you can have life here. Yeah. But then there's a the question of, well, we don't really understand how the universe was born and where did it come from. So why did the universe end up with just the right conditions for us to be here thinking about the universe? And it, 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 this then runs off into um, speculative physics, this notion that our universe is one universe in this thing called the multiverse, right? So every, there's an uh, almost uncountable number of universes out there. Each one has a different set of laws of physics, somehow given their laws by some sort of roll of the dice. And most of them are dead and sterile, but of course we're in one that, that can host us. Mm -hmm. Into the philosophical some people think, oh, well, maybe that's a sign that this is a simulation, right? So that this is, you know, we, yes, we've been set up by a, a grand programmer in another dimension, right? <laughs> and, of course, there is the theological, and there are some that say that this is evidence that God created the universe for us. So yes. the book, the book dis discusses all of the science, which is most of the book, and then we go into a little bit of the, the possibilities at the end. So it, it's, it's a science book with a little bit of philosophy and theology thrown I think, in. I think that's really awesome. And I, I think I was going to say, as you were talking there about, you know, that we look at the physics and stuff like I, I'm, I love philosophy and I love understanding um, psychological significances of religion, you know? So I'm always thinking just like when we have um, projected our consciousness onto the night sky, we're really seeing aspects of ourselves. We're not saying, Oh, that that's a God and that's a, this and that it's really just what we're seeing from the inside, you know? And when you say yeah, yeah. things like, um, you know, the physics just lines up perfectly for us to exist. It, 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 it that, that takes on that kind of, um, natural bias that, that self-centeredness approach, like, well, because I'm here, therefore this must all be perfect. And it's that, that kind of, to, to your point, it's that, that, um, religious fundamentalist, uh, notion they take and you can you, the perfect metaphor for this is um you know if, if a if a puddle a water puddle was conscious and there was a little mound of a hole uh where it had rained last night you know and then the puddle just goes oh my god i fit this hole perfectly there must be some kind of transcendent force that's looking after me it's like well yeah from, from your perspective yes but we have to remember that you know we're so much we're so we're so insignificant compared to how 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 wide and vast the universe is yeah, yeah. But actually, that, that puddle argument is a, is a kind of famous one, actually. And so mm. the fine-tuning one even goes a little bit further. You talk about the way that the water occupies the puddle. But there's, water is a strange substance, right? Mm. And its behavior depends upon the fundamental forces, right? Electromagnetism governs what water does. So the question is, you know, if the universe was slightly different and electromagnetism was different, would there even be water mm. and a hole for the water to go into. So it does run really deep in, in all of this, this kind of um, why are we here kind of thing. It's it, and complexity in the universe. When, when you're, when you're asking yourselves these questions and you're working with, uh, you had a co-author named Luke from memory. Yes. 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 Luke Barnes. Luke Barnes. Sorry. That's I remember his last name. Yeah. yeah. When, when you're kind of, you're going through these questions, you're looking at the science you're, and you're also kind of, you know, looking into the philosophy as well. Wh one question that, I think arise as well as just like how much weight we, we put onto consciousness because it's obviously all we have, you know, so it's all we're kind of yeah. using. Um, do, do you ever think that, you know, we, we just know so little about consciousness itself that it, it's very hard for us to kind of make these absolutes when it comes to the laws of the universe? It's a complicated question. I'm currently reading uh, Brian Greene's book. Uh, I think it's called Till the End of Time. And he's a, a, a cosmologist trying to broach the, the entire concept of consciousness. And of course, you know, I, you could write a book this thick on, on consciousness itself. 
So we, we thought we, w- we shouldn't really try and tread there. We want to step back and ask the question of what does the universe need for life, right? Not necessarily consciousness, but, mm-hmm. but for life. And what you need is complexity, right? You need to be able to build things up in different ways because if the universe was regular, if it was like a perfect crystal, that couldn't store or process information. And so that, that would be a difficult thing to imagine consciousness in. Mm. So we sort of said, right, the, the question isn't humans. It isn't consciousness. It's about complexity. Now, and once I've said that, that's something I can write down in the laws of physics, and I don't have to worry about all that brain stuff, which is really complicated. <laughs> complicated and unnecessary. We don't need to talk about <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so did you, uh, what, what were some of the findings that you came across as you were writing A Fortunate Universe? It's like, I'm assuming it was like a journey, and, and as you were looking at the science and some of the, the other stuff there, you're like, oh, you know, that's kind of an interesting take on something I didn't actually know. Yeah, well, the... the for me, the, the interesting part of the journey is that this covers an awful lot of physics, right? So, you know, we're talking about cosmology, we're talking about particle physics, but then you have to talk about atomic physics and molecular physics. And a lot of it was stuff that I had encountered, like as a, as a young student, et cetera. But to, to go back and really understand um, the dependencies, right? You, so you don't... You, it's a, it's a thing. It's a tricky thing to think about, right? But so you, here you are, and you're you know this big object, and you know you're made of atoms, and you know those atoms are made of electrons, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all the way down to the quarks and all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff. But then to realize that if you mess around with the little bits at the bottom, that it sort of basically propagates its way all the way up, it's sort of like a. Um, a, 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 a fine tuning butterfly effect, right? You change one thing at the tiny scale and the implications can be massive. So, so for me, that was kind of cool because you just don't think about this stuff. When you do a science class, nobody says to you, right, think about another universe. It yeah. just said, this is, this is our universe, off we go. So that for me, that was cool. And also I must admit, like most scientists, I'm not much of a philosopher, so, you know, it is one of these really bizarre things um, that um, w- w- lots of physicists don't think about the kind of questions that bother philosophers. Mm. What's the nature of time? What's the nature of space? What are dimensions and all this kind of stuff? When you get to play with the fundamental rules of the universe, those are things that you, you want to play with. Mm. And you, ha- you have to start to wonder, well, what is space? What is time? other than just something I wrote in my equations. Mm. So learning philosophy for me, um, and of course I, I, I'm still not a philosopher, uh, but seeing the kind of questions that people ask and then realizing that what I thought was trivial was mm. something actually deep and profound. The, 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 uh, you've heard of the concept of entropy, mm-hmm. right? This mm-hmm. notion that the universe is getting more and more disordered. Uh, and again, I, I did my statistical physics class. I thought I knew what entropy was until you start to read and you suddenly realize, I don't think anybody knows what entropy really is, right? Because there's more than one definition and nobody knows how they interact, those kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it, looking deeper at stuff, I think was really good. I think, I think there's, there's, all, there's this, uh, you know, eternal debate between the philosophers and the scientists and the religious and the atheists um, but I've been looking into this recently. Um, I, I was doing a lot of writing myself actually since the last time we spoke and the, some of the fundamental differences, we're kind of comparing apples and oranges. And I, I think there's a really great way, at least that helped me kind of understand where the differences lie. And it's essentially in my opinion that science kind of looks at, um, you know, the, the objectivity of, you know, the stuff, the material, what is, what's it made out of? How can we analyze and observe? And, and then philosophy and psychology to a lesser extent is, is much more about the subjectivity and how to act. And what does this mean for us as a, you know, that humanitarian approach. And I think um, it's so interesting when you say that when people, because people, you know, as an astrophysicist, someone knows, you know, about the, the, the biggest questions you're obviously, I'm assuming, don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm assuming you're going to attract people that are going to ask you these big questions. You know, what is the meaning of life, you know, given what you know and all this kind of stuff, you know? And yeah. um, I think that kind of whole meaning of life stuff is it's, it's much more of a question of what am I supposed to do with the information that you have learnt and observed? Whereas a, a scientist is primarily 
doesn't really care about what we're supposed to do. You know, morals don't really come from what a scientist observes and analyzes. Is that is that your take yeah, yeah. on things? Yeah, it, look, uh, it, it, you can get into battles by arguing over what science is and what mm. scientists, you know, think, etc. And to me, science is what scientists do. And and if you, it's kind of interesting that when you when you look at the scientific method, which is not really something we learn or do, it's just the way science sort of hoofs itself along. Understanding, right, is not really part of it. It's, mm-hmm. it's making predictions. My predictions are correct. Making more predictions. My predictions are correct. So, you know, th- th- there's a lot of, um, and I think it was Feynman, maybe you put, express this, shut up and calculate. Don't <laughs> worry True. about, don't, yeah, don't worry about the way the universe actually works. But if you can predict what's going to happen, then you're doing great science. And uh, you, you mentioned the friction between philosophers and scientists. And I think this is some of it in that scientists make predictions and then you move on and make more predictions and stop into saying, oh, well, what, what, what is a Higgs boson? Like what really is a Higgs boson? We don't do that, right? Mm. We, we've already moved on. We found the Higgs boson, right? Now we build the next collider. Yes. Yes. That, that's a really good way of, of, of looking at it. It's almost like it's, it's much more. Yeah. I, I can, I can see that. You can almost bring it down to kind of like let, you know, don't want to make generalizations, but left hemisphere people, right hemisphere people, you know, that those that think about the big and those that are primarily concerned with what's going on right in front of them. Yeah. 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 I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there, it, I mean, there, I think there is a fundamental difference in, at some level between, uh, scientists and philosophers, but of course, there's also a lot of intermingling, right? There's lots of scientists who do think about the philosophical side, and there's a lot of philosophers who think about the scientific side. Mm. So it's not as co- really distinct, mm-hmm. but uh, there, you know, there are camps that do sort of scowl at each other a bit. Yeah, yeah. And I think to your point, I think that's where we start to go wrong, where scientists start uh, preaching to the philosophers, you know, that, that uh, are interested in the subjectivity and how to act and then vice versa without actually kind of coming together because the intermingling, there's so much beauty in the inter- intermingling, you know, scientists can now predict and show and analyze just how insignificant we are and how big and vast the universe is. And obviously that's going to ripple into some of these philosophic questions pertaining to, you know, humility and, and, and exercising, um, you know, a, a lack of ego. Yeah. 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 I, I completely agree. But I, you know, I have seen, and I, I paraphrase in, I have seen philosophers tell scientists that scientists don't know how to do science. Well, that's right. Uh, <laughs> but, be, but because a philosopher has a particular view of what science is, right? Mm, mm. And it's not necessarily what happens at the coalface. So, yeah, uh, look, I, I, I'm not expecting there to be some sort of harmonious meetup up in the future. The, this friction seems to be basically written into the the two fields at the moment with a little bit of overlap, but not a huge amount. Yeah. I just think it's unfortunate. I I just don't think it has to be so polarized because ultimately, you know, you could argue that we're not trying to, to reach the same conclusion here, but in a way we are kind of trying to find out it's, it's both philosophy and science, at least in my opinion, are motivated by, innate curiosity and and that is something that can unify and it doesn't have to be so polarizing yeah 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 uh, i agree uh I, I definitely agree i wish there was more opportunity and in fact i am speaking at a philosophy forum on wednesday on what is time so I, i'm i'm bringing the scientific perspective on what is time to the to this discussion um wow but, 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 you know, one of, the, one of the honest truths is, is that there is very little opportunity for physicists and, um, physicists and philosophers to get together, right? Mm. It's just, we don't go to the same conferences. I think we barely go to the same coffee shops. I mean, we have um, different departments that don't meet, et cetera. So, yeah. So, so it is one, it's, it's, it's not made easier by the university structure and the demands on you at, at a university, right? Yes. I mean, we know how we get rewarded, how research is done, hanging out in the, with a philosopher in the coffee shop for a couple of days that, that doesn't really get you anywhere. No, so, just think, but, yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I have this innate humanitarian thing in me. I just wish we could all get along. <laughs> absolutely. Fun. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, I do agree. And, you know, I, I do think back to, um, yeah, I, I don't want to say the golden age of science, right? Because ne- there never was a golden age. But they, there was a different approach to science in the 1800s and maybe even the early 1900s mm. with regards to um, how science progressed. There wasn't the same pressure on people. There was an opportunity to talk and intermingle, which is just less prevalent today. But yeah. maybe things will change again in the future. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, that, that idea about science having a prog- progression, I'm really interested in that as well. I, what, there, was a, there was a book that I read recently called uh, Maps of Meaning by Jordan mm-hmm. Peterson. It's a, it's a huge book and he basically talks about the evolution of morality and his, his basic idea, because he wanted to try to, he was really interested in Jean Piaget um, in the 20th century and he really wanted to kind of bring this whole, um, dispute to an end, or, or at least just kind of try to understand where both sides, you know, the subject and the object were coming from essentially. And, um, his basic thesis in that is that evolution. So morality kind of evolved out of the way we act. So, cause you can, you can watch mammals and you can look how they merge into social hierarchies and things. And it's as if they're kind of governed by the laws that we can explicitly state, but obviously they're, they're unconscious, you know? So, so they're, they're operating together and, you know, they, they can, you can, you can see where the dominance hierarchy is. And it's, if they're saying, you know, that's enough and you should go and do this, that's how we operate, but they obviously can't even talk. So the yeah. basic idea is that you have this morality that evolves out of uh, acting and then watching ourselves act and then abstractly representing that over time and years and decades and centuries. And eventually what you get is myth and then religion and then philosophy and then science and it begs the question that, you know, what's going to come after science? What's the next um, most um, uh, up-to-date way to understand the world? Have you ever thought about that? Like what could be the transcendent science? Uh, uh, well, I don't know what it would be, but there, I mean, there are a lot of people who say that um, science at, at some level is reaching a, a stagnation point yeah, in, yeah. in this yeah, in the sense that we now have um, a theory of the very small, the standard model of particle physics, the theory of the very large, the standard model of cosmology, they both work exceptionally well, mm. and we know that they both must be wrong at some level. They must be incomplete, right? Wow. Because, because particle physics doesn't contain the stuff that we see in the universe, right? It doesn't contain dark matter. We know there's a lot of dark matter out there. It doesn't contain dark energy, and we know there's, there's this stuff which is causing the expansion to accelerate. And it, um, standard model of particle physics doesn't contain gravity. Uh, whereas on the large scale, we use Einstein's general theory of relativity, which does describe gravity, but none of the other forces. Mm. Um, and we can put matter and energy in, but it, that doesn't tell us what that matter and energy actually is. So we've, re- we've got these highly, highly successful work in theories, and we are desperate for something to break. I, we want an observation that doesn't fit because that tells us where we should go mm-hmm. and we're just not finding it, right? So, you know, scouring the skies, looking for think, like, things that don't fit, scouring the particle accelerators, things that don't fit. And some people are suggesting that we've reached this point because we have become separated from philosophy. We've stopped asking the what is really going on questions. Mm. And we've relied on this. I'm going to make a prediction and move on. I'm going to make a prediction and move on. Just my maths, etc. And so maybe it is that science and philosophy will have to come back together uh, such that we can have a new way of asking the questions. Because all we're doing now is asking this, you know, questions in exactly the same way. And there are people who wonder that maybe if it is the scientific method that's the problem, then maybe we need a new approach to asking questions. So what do you we, think? we don't know. Oh, I, I, I wouldn't hazard a guess, tell you the truth. I mean, because, again, I, I, am, not, I am not enough of a philosopher. I, I, do, I do have this feeling and I'm, I'm old enough now that I see the adoption of ideas into science, which were f- flaky ish when I was a young scientist mm-hmm. have become more solidified now, but the, 
the sort of evidence behind it hasn't increased as much as the, and I'm going to put the word in air quotes, belief uh-huh. in it. So, so dark matter is one of the, the um, is one of the topics, right? So dark matter is made, thought to be this matter that pervades the universe. Right? It's the dominant mass out there. And in, back in the 1980s, when I started my science career, that's essentially when this notion of dark matter was out there, it's been discovered. It was like, we need something else in the universe. Mm -hmm. And there were ideas that, well, maybe it is a, a substance, right? Or maybe it's that we've got gravity wrong. Maybe we don't understand gravity on large scales, right? And what has happened is, is that the entire field has basically lent one way towards it being a substance, right? Because it's easy to deal with if you think of it as a substance. Yes. And it's harder to deal with if you want to say that gravity is wrong because gravity in its current form, that was derived by Einstein. And so, you know, you need a big brain to take the next step there and in the right direction. And, you know, we've now gone in this direction where, we, where most of the field thinks it's a substance and there are experiments being built to search for it as a substance. There's there's one up the road from you in stall, actually Mm. in the the old gold mine, they're building a Mm -hmm. physics laboratory to search for dark matter particles. Wow. And a a fraction of a percent say, no, gravity could still be wrong, but the consensus shifted one way and we haven't really ruled out the other idea. And so this is, you know, again, this is one of those things that science does have these, issues about it with that people like the current idea and the current idea becomes the thing. And then you move on again. And maybe this, this is how you've ended up at this. You've gone down, you know, a a whole series of alleyways and you've finally reached the blind alley. How far do you backtrack to before you find find the right path? Yeah. And, and, and this is, I don't know the answer, Uh, but some, you know, I know there are people that are saying that dark matter 1980s, there are people saying, oh, well, physics started to go wrong in the 1930s. You know, others, you know, saying it was a bad idea that we came out of the sea in the first place kind of thing. <laughs> right? but, Fair claim to that. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, it's, a, it's a big question. And it, it could be wrong, right? In the sense that tomorrow, some smart person might just go, hang on, I can put gravity and the other forces together and bang, we're off, off in a new direction. But a lot of people are feeling that, you know, we've been now spinning our wheels, developing um, uh, these fundamental theories for, well, you know, Einstein on his deathbed was working on unifying gravity with the other forces. Mm. And that was 1955. And here we are now, and we have definitely made advances. We definitely understand the workings of the universe in a lot more detail. But we do seem to be hitting this brick wall. Mm-hmm. And we've, we, you know, we've been hitting it for a long time. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, my, my money, my money is on, okay, because I, I, I have great faith in humanity. My money is on that as education systems around the world get better and better and we can tap into the mental power, right? We know that there are smart people all around the world without opportunity to do science, mm-hmm. that somebody somewhere, you know, I, I can't remember who was the, there was a great scientific, scientist who quote, made a quote about this, that, you know, that, that their worry about science is that the, a great mind was locked in a sweatshop in India, yeah. right? Yeah. Rather than having the opportunity to contribute. Yes. And of course, as education is improving around the world, hopefully it will come. But we, do, you know, I said there is, there is a, a, bit, a bit of a dark cloud of pessimism that maybe we can't see through this wall. Yeah. And, and, uh, And I'll mention one other thing as well, which Mm. is even more terrifying in the sense that maybe we can't see through this wall because we are slightly evolved apes and we just don't have the brain power. Yes. Right. You know, we've done well, right. Congratulations us. Right. But you know, it's, (laughs) it's, it's been a couple of million years since we were picking fleas off each other and and swinging in the trees. Some are still doing it. (laughs) (laughs) Some are still doing it. So it, it, it might be that, you know, that maybe there is a limit to, human mental capacity mm. and mm. and we might not ever be able to see the answer and i you know and as a human i can't even imagine what that means no no but, no but we, we we do know that a dog can't do integrals right um the, the dog doesn't the dog doesn't know but you know so how do, how do we know what we don't know yes exactly exactly right but i suppose like because 
one of the most fascinating, um, you know, uh, theories to come out of psychology and, and neuropsychology is neuroplasticity and this, this mm-hmm. the brain's ability to learn and grow. And that's now, you know, you know, we thought that the, the, the brain was hardwired really. And then neuroplasticity came along and just blew all that out. And then epigenetics yeah. came along and blew all, and threw all the hardwired biology theory out as well. So we really start looking, and this is where the new age spiritualists love this idea because it's kind of like, you know, these new theories are coming out that are really kind of um, pushing against that hardwired material. Um, this is who we are. This is how we've evolved, you know, and, and, and you, you can start to see them jumping towards the, the transcendent ideas the we are nothing but conscious awareness stuff. And, you know, potential can be infinite because we can apply ourselves here and grow there or, you know, because we're, we're, we're plastic and we can keep growing. And one of the things that you said there is, you know, it, to me, it sounds like this almost kind of this spiritual idea of burning off the dead wood so that you can continue to grow. Maybe we just reached the point where science has got us this far. And now it's something that is evolving from, you know, the bottom up approach is, is, is going to take us to this next area. We don't know what we're going to be calling that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there is a very, um, and I've only really come to appreciate this in the, in the last few years, there is an area of science, which, I think is very, very important in that, um, you know, you know, science, you pick up a science textbook, it's all about the equations, right? Mm -hmm. Mathematical equations. And, um, but what you find is that when you deal with real stuff, us or, um, the universe, maybe our atoms, et cetera, are governed by those equations. We can write down an equation to talk about at how atoms interact, but then you get into this notion of complex systems, how many different things doing simple things interact to produce complex behavior. Mm. And we realize that we can't write down the equations to describe that complex behavior in a simple fashion. Mm. It just becomes too difficult to calculate. And I think that, that maybe that this will be a direction that we will have to go in, in the sense that, um, you know, we we did the easy part, right? We wrote down the equations. And, and so the, the equations themselves might be very, very ugly, um, but that's the easy part. The hard part is asking, right, now I've got something governed by all of those equations. What's the emergent behavior? So that's the, the, the phrase at the moment. What emerges from simple things interacting? Mm. And, you know, there are, there are definitely those that think that consciousness, intelligence are related to things in your mind, neurons, which are simple things. They have a potential and they fire, put them together in a complicated network. And suddenly you can store memories. You can think you have a consciousness, but you know, we're a long way from talking about the, the, the activity in the brain, although people are trying to do this from how these simple things work. Yeah. So, and, and I'll, I'll mention that, that I, I know, um, uh, a scientist at the moment, I, uh, I won't mention her name, but she is my wife, but um, <laughs> who, 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 who's working on um, synthetic intelligence. Can you build a mechanical device that has the properties of the neurons in the brain such that it rewires itself in the same way as you talk about neural plasticity? Whoa. And so it can learn, right? You wow. feed it stimulus and it restructures itself to know how to respond to that stimulus. Wow. So, you know, that's, that gets into, uh, that's almost science fiction, right? The yeah. Asimov and positronic brains, et cetera. But yeah, I mean, that's where people are thinking, right? It, it, maybe I, maybe I, I can just worry about the equations for the simple things and then look at what emerges when I put lots of simple things together. Yeah, yeah ab- absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that idea that, because yeah. And and again, it comes back to that idea of us being inherently self-centered, you know, and anxiety is a, it's the emotion of self-centeredness. We're always kind of worried how we fit into the the jigsaw puzzles and things, you know, and, um, you know, we can look at a a dog. I've got a dog right here, just walked in by itself, opened the door, you know, and I, I assume that it doesn't have, um, self-awareness because I can just look at the size of its prefrontal cortex. It's much smaller than mine. I hope, um, it's definitely governed by the mammalian brain, you know, by emotions and feelings. I can see positive emotion and negative emotion 
when we interact, but I don't know it possesses the ability to record a podcast on zoom. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, it's one of those things, but coming back to that point you were making about scientists, science reaching its kind of, you know, the last dead end or something. Does this come back to, is it almost necessary for science then do you think to step back and ask itself what it's actually doing as a, as a, as a model of trying to understand the universe? Do you like, is, is the idea behind science to become omniscient? Like what, what's the goal? If we're, if we're reaching all of these dead ends and things, do we, do we need to take a step back and go, okay, what are we doing? It depends how close to that wall we're going to, we're going to get. I mean, you, you have to, you have to sort of remember, right? As scientists in their day job, most of them are focused on a very small area. So, you know, one person might be trying to measure the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon or something. Uh, others might be, oh, I'm observing the rotation curves of distant galaxies. So, you know, science is, um, it's, it's not a single enterprise, mm. right? It's thousands of people around the world squirreling away on their things. And to them, the, the notion of the big picture problem uh, is often not seen, right? You, yeah. you, if you bl- blink it and you look in this way. But I, th- I think that yet yeah, maybe we do need to take a step back, but how you do that, mm. right? How, how do you organize for all of science to say, I'm going to take a step back? Now, you have to remember, of course, the majority of scientists in the world are not thinking about the fundamental, yeah. right? They're not thinking about the, the makeup of the universe at the tiny scale or the large scale. Most of them are solid state physicists worried about materials and surfaces and the battery technology and all that kind of stuff, right? Lots and lots of very practical stuff. Mm. They're making great advances, so they're fine. Um, but yeah, the, the question of how you do that with the fundamental aspects of the universe, who is it you're asking to take a step back? Mm. And if, even if you ask them, what does that actually mean for them? Mm. And, you know, how, how, do you, how do you tell people that you need to do something different and make sure they all start doing something different when they're all just doing their own thing anyway? Yeah, right? exactly. And so, it should come right? from the people doing it as well. I mean, I have absolutely no stake in this to be like, hey, you guys, I mean, I, I read a couple of books. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, and there are scientists who, who are saying that maybe, maybe we do need to change things. But, you know, scientists are stubborn buggers. They will only really change if things really, really stop working, right? Mm-hmm. If, if, you know, uh, I mean, I, I will try not to be uh, too mean to, to old scientists, but there's a saying, right? It's that science progresses one funeral at a time. Mm. And what that means is that, oh, it takes a long time for old ideas, old approaches to disappear. What is needed is, is a new approach needs to come in and say, look at, the, look at what you can get if you do this instead of that. And then the junior scientists take it on and then things expand. But yeah, by, yeah. by a decree by fiat isn't going to work. No, but it's, fact, not, it's not just scientists either, though. It's just human beings. I mean, look at look at our response to climate change. You know, it, it's just, what, what response? <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. I wouldn't say it's scientists. It's just human nature is just we don't. We're fearful of change. It's you know, it's existentially confusing. We like being safe and comfortable, and a, a big part of that is ideological safety and opinions yeah. staying the same. Because then we don't have to think differently, and thinking is scary. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, and thinking that, uh, you know, there are things going on beyond our control, mm. right? Um, that, you know, we can't control the climate. We can, we can help uh, limit what we do, but we can't control it. Mm. Um, and yeah, look, we could get into a long debate here about all kinds of things and true. capitalism and blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, it, but it, it'll be up until the last minute and then we'll go everyone everything will change yes. uh, we'll have to live through some disasters but we yes. will learn our lesson just after it's too late it's true I, I do really agree with that i think if there's something that's uh wonderfully paradoxical and um profound about human nature is that we wait till the very last second and then we go oh shit we have to do something and then we do yeah. eventually learn our lesson it's just like how much good are we going to carry through the mud in order to get to that next utopia? 
Well, yeah, I, I talk about it. I, I, I've got a talk where I talk about the long-term future history of the universe, right? Oh, and uh, what, what we know is that in about a billion years, our sun will have gotten to be too hot that um, the sunlight would basically burn off the atmosphere and evaporate the oceans. So humans, if we survive that long, in a billion years, have to leave the planet. Yep. But we would do it the day before, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Yeah, we will wait until that point and go, okay, let's go now. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it's just bizarre. It is just very, very bizarre. So it's just it's just the Titanic. We'll, we'll all be a part of the concert. We'll be playing the violin. Yeah. And we'll jump on the last boat. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's unbelievable. Great. I know um, I know I've got to get you out of here in um, about 10 or so minutes, but um, okay. that, that was a hell of a lot of time on, on the first, <clears throat> on the first book. We'll, we'll put um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some show notes. What are the, I suppose we should jump to the, the book that you're kind of working on now. Have you, have you given anyone an idea of what you're working on or keeping that a secret? Um, no, I, we can start talking about it because we've delivered the final manuscript. So I, I wrote this book with, with Chris Ferry. Do you know Chris? I've heard that name, yeah. Why do I yeah, know? he's written a, a series of books of something for babies, like quantum mechanics oh, for babies, yes. Yes, cryptography yes, yes. for babies. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. brilliant. So he, nice. Yeah, yes. So, but, he, you know, he's got a lot of those, but this book is not, not for babies. <laughs> and it's uh, we're still sorting out the final title, but it's something along the lines of um, the quark and the cosmos. No, the quantum and the cosmos. Sorry, I, I got the word quark in my head there. The quantum and the cosmos. And essentially what we're trying to do is demonstrate that uh, in understanding the, the life of the universe, um, we, t- we have to talk about the large scale and we have to talk about the small scale. Mm. And so these ideas, which are, seem very different when they g- get presented often, the cosmology in the expanding universe and quantum mechanics and what goes on on the small scale, they are implicitly tied together if you want to understand phenomena in the universe. So we sort of talk about the early stages of the universe, the universe today and the universe in the future and how the cosmology and quantum mechanics are intertwined in, in all of that. So it's meant to be a bit of a guide to the entire life of the universe mm-hmm. um, from, from world to go and questions of where did the universe come from and where did the universe go? Is, where's the universe going to? Um, so it, it's, um, it's it's not a not not meant to be a long book. It's, so it's it's I said it's it's short, sharp. This is the life of the universe, and this is how we think things work. Mm, that's brilliant. That's it's brilliant because I think uh, it it's just so unfathomable to to even conceptualize how small we go. You mentioned the word quarks. You know that idea that yeah, that's essentially like that atoms and even small subatomic particle particles. You know, and then how vast it is, and then how we, this is my, this is my real, uh, not concern. It's not a, you know, it's not a concern at all, but my real, where I get confused about seeing the world, seeing the universe as, um, as a, as some kind of material entity, because what it's made of is so small and so vast. It doesn't make any sense to me. This is because I'm not a scientist, but it doesn't make any sense to me that we can find ourselves in this kind of middle plane. You know, we can perceive ourselves from the level of hands and face, you know, but we know when we're talking about this and it's been measured that it's so much smaller than that. Like it just, it's just so unfathomable. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as a scientist, I have to think about it. Right. So, you know, I, I do like to think that it is true that human beings, the scale of a human being is actually on, on a, on a logarithmic scale, halfway between the smallest and the largest sizes that we worry about. In, in the universe. So, you know, we are in that, um, as you said, this middle ground. Um, and it, it is kind of, it is kind of interesting, isn't it? That, uh, that, that all of that stuff, the very small and the very large has basically been hidden from us, uh, hidden in quotes over most of the life of, of human beings. Mm, yeah. We've only uncovered the very small over the last hundred or so years. Mm. We've only discovered the extent of the universe over the last hundred or so years. Up until that point, we, you know, no notion that we're made of smaller stuff, right? We, we, no. we know there's little bits and pieces, but not, not atoms. Uh, or uh, that there's really anything beyond the stars. The stars are out there and then maybe that was it. But this idea that there are billions of light years out there, that's a very, very new concept. So, you know, most of the time we, you just went, nah, there's the sky, there's the ground, there's me, that's it. But now you have to go, 
and there's quarks and there are so many quarks. If you think about how many quarks there are and how big the universe is, right? It, it is, uh, it is kind of mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. It, now is that, is that, is it, is it, is it okay for a scientist to be blown away by, the, by that or they have to consistently focus on the measurements and the predictions and things? Uh, yeah, you can spend five minutes being blown right. away, right? But 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 this is this is one of the bizarre things is is that you know I've been uh, a scientist now for almost thirty years since I started my PhD, mm-hmm. and uh, you just get into the habit of writing things down and not thinking about it. So I will often write down uh, like uh, one one problem, like working at looking at a galaxy, right? You know, so I, I know that in the galaxy, there's probably 200 billion stars. So I can write down 200 billion. A billion is a number I can sort of understand because that's related to people on Earth, right? So 200 billion. Now, I know the mass of each of those stars is about the mass of the sun. And the sun is around 10 to the 30 kilograms, right? So already that's a big number, right? So you know, one followed by 30 zeros. So the mass of that galaxy, you know, is around 10 to the 42 kilograms. All right, so I, I'll write that down. I'm quite happy with that. Yes. But then I say, well, that's now made of protons and neutrons, and they have a mass of around 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Oh so I put those all together. Now, now that inside that galaxy, there's around 10 to the 50 of these protons and neutrons. And I, you have problems where you work with these numbers, yeah. and you just don't think about them anymore, right? Uh, They're just... The numbers on a page, and but you do stop and you sort of think, that's really what I'm talking about. I'm talking yeah. about all these individual bits and pieces. It, it's um, it's insane, isn't it? And and I mean, we do that a lot. You know, I think you you can look at. I'm very interested in childhood development. You know, developmental psychology. And you look at a child and they're just mesmerized by the world, and they're putting everything in their mouth because they just you know they're almost like one with the world because they you know they don't have an ego yet, so they're not disconnected yeah. and separate from all the things because they're trying to figure out all the things, you know, but when we get to adulthood, you know, it's just like, yeah, I'm speaking to great. He's a friend of mine. I'm speaking to him on a tiny little screen in real time. You know, he happens to be hundreds of kilometers North uh, from me right now, but we're speaking in real time, you know, and we're, we're actually just primates that wear shoes. Um, but yeah, that's, that's mm-hmm. normal. You know, we, we, we actually forget about the, we lose the awe uh, for the, for the routine. <laughs> Uh, well, exactly, exactly. And um, we, it's not only losing the ore, we also lose, uh, lose uh, I think, a little bit of the, the curiosity, mm, right? Mm. I mean, I, 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 uh, I have a microwave over there. Ask most people, how does a microwave work? Exactly. Right? And you may, the, the answer may as well be magic. Yeah, it should, right? totally. Uh, yeah. And ask how, how is the communication getting from my laptop here to your computer there? What's going on? Again, yeah. it might as well be magic, right? Absolutely. Because most people, most people have no idea, right? They, and, and they don't need to know. And so you just keep doing your stuff. But in reality, if you think about it, and again, I could write down the numbers about how many electrons are moving in here. And again, we'd be there with these huge numbers and about the, the, all the fields and then the quantum mechanics stuff going on. Yes. In reality, everything is kind of amazing. It, it's phenomenal. And, and this is... Uh... I, th- I think what would be lovely actually, Grain, is we, um, if, uh, we, we organize another time to chat maybe in a week or two and we could do like a part two, cause we had for everyone listening, this, this would be edited now, but we had some, um, internet difficulties in the beginning. Um, but yeah, we should, we should do a part two. I think that'd be brilliant. Great. But I was, I was yeah, yeah, that'd be a, great. Yeah. Awesome. I was just going to make a point there about, you know, what's, what's true, you know, and, and understanding truth there, because your point, it's like, I, you could say it's magic and, um, that would almost be enough for me when it comes to what a microwave is, because you would throw this, if you were a microwave expert, you would throw this jargon at me such that it would just become arbitrary. And I was like, magic makes sense in the same way that the word malaria means bad air. Now that, that is a kind of truth because, you know, prior to understanding how mosquitoes, um, you know, uh, spread the disease and, and all that sort of stuff, you could just essentially sit back and be like, well, that air is bad. You know, it, mm-hmm. it's a different kind of way. I think it's not scientifically accurate or objectively accurate, but it is a it is a nuanced kind of truth. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I I completely agree. I completely mm. agree. And of course, even with the the scientific answers, you have to be careful with the word truth. Mm. Scientists don't like the word truth mm. because 
what we have are ideas that work. Now, whether or not that is the actual way the universe is, we don't know. And we can never know at some level. Mm. And we just go with what works. Mm. So I can talk about magnetic fields, electric fields, electrons, etc. cetera. Um, but the next theory of physics that might come along might do away with all of those concepts. Yeah. As long as the experimental results come out to be the same. Um, yeah, the, the notion that they're truly an electric field, a magnetic field, you know, that's, that's a concept for the idea I've got now, but not, maybe not from the idea I've got tomorrow. Yes, yes. And, you know, to bring it back full circle, this is why I think it's impossible to be... Uh, a, a consciously arrogant scientist, because if you're truly a scientist, you, you have to have some humility there based, based on, you know, that morality there, kind of what you said there is like, well, this works for now. Um, there's a lot of humility in what you're saying. Yes, there is, but oh God, man, there's a lot of ego in science, but yeah. that the <laughs> ego, the, the, the humility, uh, the ego comes from, um, chest thumping, right? Yes. You know, it, it, that, it, think big, things like big prizes, Nobel prize. I got the Nobel prize, you know, Hey, look at me. <laughs> uh, so, so there is ego that, but I think if a lot of scientists took time to think about the universe, there would be a bit more humility. Yes. And maybe that's just, yeah, that's, that's your faculty because you're an astrophysicist. You're constantly dealing with the vast, you know, basically I'm just getting around you, mate. You know, you're, you're a humble man and I've liked you since I met you. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to hear <laughs> well great we'll, we'll have to do a uh, a part two i think we um so many things i want to talk i want to talk about your second book um i want to mm-hmm. i want to just keep keep talking i love it and uh we'll, we'll make that happen hopefully in the next couple of weeks if you're free yeah yeah next couple of weeks works well for me done we'll, we'll uh we'll lock it in so this will be part one and uh guys thanks so much for listening tune in for part two that'll be brilliant great thank you so much mate thank you Cheers, guys. Bye. Hey, guys. If you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.